Gentlemen, welcome back to the shop. Today, a treat especial, the grinder that won the West, the venerable Makita Rat Tail 5-inch grinder. Straight from the scrap bin to our healing bench. Thank you very much, heavy industry, and your high labor costs. As you can plainly see, ain't nobody got time to fix something broken. It's not worth it. Could it be? Could it be? I bet you it is. Now, I do enjoy me a good grinder, and this is a good grinder. Maybe not the best, debatably, arguably, but she's good enough for the girls I go out with. And these are ubiquitous in light and heavy industries, as well as uh, the homeowner market. Pretty much the best grinder you're ever going to find at the homeless death spot. And of course, Makita has been managed essentially by the same progression of people for uh, the last hundred years. Uh, 1915, something like that, incorporated in... 38 and they built the first cordless grinder actually or cordless drill it's not yeah not actually cordless battery powered because essentially it was just a drill with a with a battery pack on the end but 1969 first battery powered drill they've been around a long time i never had any troubles whatsoever with any makita tools kind of partial to them unfortunately i'm an autumn in my coloring and this just doesn't go this shade of uh, pukey teal just doesn't go with my skin tone. We're just going to test to see if and we can get some contiguation going on here. Ah, okay. So, we know that it's an electrical problem. Oh, look at that. OG factory cab tire. No third wire for the ground conductor. Of course, this is a double insulated tool. This one probably made in uh, Butte, Georgia, or Boo. Uh, what's the guy's name there in uh, Bubba? No. Bu Buford. Buford, Georgia. Sorry. That's the, uh, yeah, you know, the guy in uh, Forrest Gump there. Forrest Gump's buddy. Benjamin Buford Blue. Buford, Georgia is where Makita has a factory i believe if i'm not mistaken if they haven't closed it down one thing about makita is uh they're not nearly as uh, vile cutthroat as the rest of the guys seem to be you know profit above all they're still based in japan and they they build up factories in a lot of different countries you know they got one in finland and canada and the us and a and brazil and you know so there is a lot of locally built tools whereas it's not all in China and that might have something to do with a cultural artifact of uh, Japanese culture uh, anyway we won't comment on that but oh look at that we got the go fast button there you can ride it right into a low earth orbit and it won't turn off on you <clears throat> no that was not the problem okay well we were gonna take her a part anyway for the bolter so now that we know that the uh, problem's electrical, we can look for some shit stains. At the same time, we'll go over the construction with our usual rigor. Mortis. Ah, uh, ha, <laughs> yeah. The whole trick of it is you need to be smarter than the wire. Now, you might not realize this, but when in you're like me and you're making vajayos, uh, you know, guys looking over your shoulder and having a laugh in the shop, Occasionally you set to talk in there and you your mouth gets ahead of you. Oh yeah. Oh there we go. Look at that. Bam 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 No one second for the second time. Booyah Kasha. It works. It's working. Okay, now all we gotta do is uh, put a little cab tire in there and Bob's your auntie. Gotta love consumer, mass consumer, throwaway culture. Thank you, modern age. Ah, oh, took the brush out. What for looking at it? And uh, lo and behold, it's brand new. So if somebody did have a go with this, uh, unfortunately, you know, hey, just follow my 18 simple troubleshooting steps. Number one being simplest thing first. If you see that cock end on there that's dingle dangling around, <laughs> 
And that's of course why we use the pillar of troubleshooting rule number two is never trust the work that came before you, even if you did that work because there is no easier person to fool than yourself. You know, it can't be the cord because I just fixed it. Now, despite being able to pick one of these up for a paltry 150 Canadian pesos, this is a high-end tool and we can tell it's high-end uh, right off the bat because they're using good materials. Now we have PA6 GF30. That's uh, nylon reinforced with glass fiber. Of course, like in uh, fiber glass, well, they make yachts out of this stuff. Like it's tough when they put the glass fiber in and the resin. Well, instead of resin, they're using nylon, which is a, a very tough material and impact resistant, super good. And then here we have a, this would be a secondary molded. It'd be uh, over molded. So they'd mold this, you know, they, they put a shot of this mixed material into it into a mold it would solidify and then that mold would move over to another mold and then they would do a shot of this TPE I assume TP yeah TPE so this is um, thermo thermoset thermoplastic elastomer uh, that encompasses a whole bunch of different plastics it could be a urethane could be a styrene compound but there's no indication of what exactly it is but it's an over molded you know, soft kind of rubbery material that is not even close to being rubber and in here in between the steering wheel and the seat this is what always breaks this is what interfaces with the 200 pound gorilla so it must be robust and you can hear it indeed is quite robust due to the snap action and just the toughness of this switch uh, this is interesting they have actually made a little slot here for inventory control this is an anti theft device it's one of those these magneto strictive sensors that uh, you hit it with a magnet a tough enough magnet and it it de uh, calcifies it de something and anyway it wrecks it so it doesn't get picked up going through the door but it's built right in from the factory <clears throat> and this is the switch it's a satori 16 amp this is very robust and it doesn't only switch the neutral or the hot it switches both of course it'd be copper contacts nice beefy spring and a snap action and the copper contacts would be silver electroplated so yeah very nice uh, switch i mean you could feel it now we're going to get into the meaty bits and I just had a look at this. This of course is the lock in order to uh, change the wheel and you can see this has had some serious use. It's getting worn right out and actually on the DeWalt that I thought maybe was going to be the Makita killer. I've seen two of those units and the gear here that, that drives this, the crown gear is actually uh, centered metallic on that DeWalt. And it had just a tiny little detent or pinholes what for locking this and I figured that that would be the failure and sure enough on two the two units that I've seen that is the failure is that those round over and you can't lock it anymore so whatever wheel is on there is stuck on there forever and then of course the tool is useless so sort of a stupid failure uh, you know you would think they would just make that hole a little bit bigger so that the pin wouldn't be so tiny and it wouldn't round over as much. But, you know, there's designed, there's engineered uh, failures in there so that you do have to buy these on occasion. But this, as you can see, this one's starting to get worn out too, but it's not so much, I bet you when we take this apart, it's not so much in the crown gear, but more in this little pokey bit. Now, and this is cool to see. They beefed up this assembly. I'm just taking the head off now. They beat this up because in the old one, it wasn't quite as robust. And you would break the grill, as you can see. Yoo-hoo! As you can see, that's for cooling air. You'd break that grill off. And the button wasn't nearly as user-friendly. Little tiny button, so gloved hands. It was a, it's a real pain, right? in the cunning linguals to get that to lock. But... With this one, you don't have that problem. So it's nice to see, even though they have a product that for the longest time, I mean, absolutely dominated the market, they still made improvements. And not just 
improvements in that they reduce the cost of the whole units, but actual improvements in that they improve the longevity of the units. Now look at this, it's barely been used. We'll get into that momentarily. Here's the fan. It's a, some sort of thermal plastic fan. And you can see, well, if you came down from Mars, you'd be able to figure out that this is not a reversing tool because the veins of the fan are in one direction. Also, uh, one thing I failed to mention on this is there's no solid state electronics in here because there's no need for speed control. It's off or on. Now, this is an extremely robust motor rotor. You can see here, beautiful, like epoxied all the windings in here. This would have been machined epoxy. Um, you know, some, some robot comes in and, and does it on a machine. But where the connection is made at the commutator bars, it's all epoxied. And then they've also balanced it. Where are the balancing slots here? Right there. Very little taken out. So they, yeah, they've got it real, like super dialed in. Uh, we had the fine grinder apart and uh, you could see they took a lot of material out in order to get it balanced. This uh, doesn't seem to have nearly as much material taken out of the silicon steel uh, laminations here. These are very magnetically permeable uh, silicon steel laminations. They're electrically separated from each other to uh, reduce the eddy currents. Lower eddy currents equals letter, lower hysteresis losses. That means lower heat, essentially. And if you just had a big chunk of steel here, you would get a lot of heat built up because the magnetic fields would, would create eddy currents of electricity going through here. It would just be a, a big old heater. So that is why when you see transformers or you take anything apart it's all laminated steel that's why they do that to reduce the hysteresis losses and in layman's terms the easiest way i think of hysteresis is um it, it's a you know it's a 10 penny word but essentially it is you saturate the magnetic field in here so it can't the magnetic field cannot get any stronger and then when you drop it back down to zero you it keep some residual magnetism in there that you need to overcome because of course this is running on AC. So the difference between being magnetized north-south and south-north, that is the hysteresis. And the wider that gap, the more energy it takes, the more heat it creates. So that is hysteresis, the difference in magnetizing one way or the other. Now for the gearheads in the crowd, the easy way that I think about that is hysteresis as mechanical slop. So say you have a pin, you have a pinned connection. You need to push it a little bit to take up the slop before this actually moves. Okay, so that hysteresis is if you push it this way, then there's a lot more slop to go this way before this thing actually moves. It is magnetic slop. That is hysteresis. And also, you can describe hysteresis in mechanical systems as well. And essentially, it's, a, it's an engineer's term, a, a fancy word for slop. You know, like a doctor might say, he's got a contusion on his Rugai Ridge. Well, it's a, it's a little scrape on the, uh, on the line that goes up your ball sack. But if you don't know, you don't know, right? And we run into this all the time because the world is so specialized and, and people's professions are so specialized that they develop their own lingo, their own uh, Sithbolith, so that outsiders aren't privy to the same information. But as soon as you learn the lingo, you're golden. So I myself take great pleasure in satirizing that. And uh, people say I speak funny, but it's really, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, for fuck snakes, it's just us girls here. Nobody likes a white blanket. So, uh, <sighs> No need to be serious all the time. I gotta go get my wife to hold my hernia. Okay, we're into the gearing and this is a beauty. Uh, first you look at that and it's all pitted, hideous, but one feature here, really smart, is they made a detent, a little ramp, to get that to go, you know, it sort of wants to go to its home so you can lock it in and, and change the blade on it or the wheel. 
but you can see this is a forged part so forged steel and then uh, the crown gear is hobbed I mean beautiful if you look at the competition like the DeWilt it is a sintered metallic gear so they take powder and stick it together and then heat it up and kind of hope for the best now and yes fit for purpose that is what Kunsten tongue slide is made out of the inserts that that cut steel of course the paragon of materials but that it's really really hard it's not uh, suitable for any kind of impact resistance and yeah I mean as far as suitability for gears forged is the way to go and that is a beauty I mean barely even been used look at that tiny little bearing on there but this is just to locate it it's not doing anything the big bearing is in this nice beefy housing here this would be uh, a 398 I believe aluminum casting and nothing special there but fairly beefy okay trap for young gamers this bearing is caged it doesn't go in this way um, so you can't pull it out directly so if you start reefing on this you're gonna wreck something and of course it's blind sided by this uh, fan nice PA6 same material as the casement but you can see something whacked it good a whole bunch of chunks taken out of it but uh, should run all right anyway this is a 6000 series bearing and it's actually 6000 that's uh, 26 OD and 8 on the ID I believe right around 500 pounds static this can take so double that for dynamic thousand pounds so nice little bearing and it's uh, not just shielded it's actually a sealed bearing permanently lubricated but of course <clears throat> you have to take off that nut that caging nut in order to get this off now look at this feature there is no keyway so how the hell does this actually go on there and stay on there well the this say eight millimeter thread puts out so much force and you multiply that by the uh, static coefficient of friction of steel on steel that you would never get this pinion to slip unless this nut backed off you'd never get it to slip now some people say would might say well that would be good uh, a good safety feature in case you stop the wheel dead and you wouldn't tweak anything but the force is such that you would actually shear this before that slipped in order to get that sort of clutch mechanism you would need a torque limiter you would need some sort of spring clutch mechanism on here in order to get this to actually slip so uh, yeah interesting feature no keyway required and at first glance the bearing looked a little chewy to me because it was weeble wobbling but I see now uh, as part of the assembly there's a nice big bearing on the back side and that retains it uh, rigidly in there and the way to check a bearing of course is not to just spin it and feel it but you need to put it under load in order to feel if there's any rough spots and this is an excellent way to inspect bearings because under load you can feel any tiny little vibration or any amount of schmoo whatsoever it, uh, it's almost like an amplification yeah so that bearing is good to go and on the back side of the rotor 608 with a whole bunch of nomenclature at the end probably a special uh, motor bearing with special clearances sealed and then special grease in there what for longevity our 608 bearing that's uh, uh, right around three four hundred uh, pounds static so a little bit smaller bearing than on this side but still very skookum and an interesting feature here is this compound uh, prevents e ingress of the brush which the brush material can be uh, clay centered and it can be a very abrasive uh, to certain things however I think it's trying to protect mainly trying to protect the seal from the ultraviolet rays from the uh, arcing and sparking of the commutation so that's an interesting feature uh, here we have the field winding beautiful high temperature epoxy potted ah spared no expense lovely look at the brush holders monsters monsters now that would be brass of course because a uh, nice soft brass because bronze and it doesn't conduct heat very well 
and uh, it doesn't conduct electricity that well either. So those are brass and you can see they're not just little spade connectors, there's a big huge spring of a thing that goes all the way around the circumference and a nice big crimp on lug there that goes on the wire itself, you can see that, and then goes to the spring that makes contact. Beautiful system. I mean, Skookum is frig robust. These things are built to run. And of course, if you've ever seen a welder, now I'm more of a grinder myself. Grinder and paint makes me the welder I ain't, as they say, or rather as I say. But these things get a hot supper day in and day out. 200 pound gorillas just a reefing on them. So they got to be Skookum. If they would build drills and whatnot to these kind of standards, your drill at home would never break because these things are skookum as frig. Now another detail on these brush holders, a lot of times in tools the brass part will be directly in the PA6 which is nylon of course and we're at 470 degrees here on the Heiko 888D and you can actually hear it melting and pushing the glass fibers around kind of a scrapey noise but if we put that on the plastic component, it must be some sort of resin because it doesn't even touch it. So, some sort of phenolic, it likely will not melt, it will burn. Now we're up at 670 degrees. Still doesn't even touch it. We're going up just about as high as she'll suffer there, we're at 850 degrees on the Heiko. Doesn't melt it. Incredible. Yeah, you can see. Just goes right through that PA6 like a hot knife through butter. Though so putting this back together and it goes together nice. It's very nice serviceability. However, you can see here the wires. Now I replaced the pigtail here. But you can see here the wires are quite anemic. However, at least they're stranded. They're not solid. So that's good, um, even though they are quite anemic. So if you had a problem that wasn't the trigger, you'd want to look at these, and wasn't the cord, of course. You'd want to look at these wires to make sure nothing was broken in here, especially down in here. Now I have an eye for detail. Some might say a disease for detail. But there's very little to actually complain about on this machine. It's very well built and very well engineered. Yeah, the... You know, it doesn't have the same style points that the Fine had. I, I'm not quite sure if it's up to the par of uh, Metabo. Now we come to it. Normally you work at a tool for this long with your hands and you get the money shot, which is a, a nasty surprise. But in this case, hopefully the money shot is going to be far less nasty. Contact! There you go. Gooder than new, just nicely broken in, free 99, son of a diddly, you can't beat that deal with a stick. And even if you gotta buy one of these brand new, 150 Canadian pesos, you know, they have a saying in French, tu manges ton sou, tu manges ton sou, sorry, uh, la, la gueule de bois, but that means essentially you're eating your money's worth, you get the belly full, and uh, you'd be hard pressed to find a better grinder at this price point. Thanks for watching. Keep your dick in a vice. Oh, also, I had a patron request. That's a double insulated symbol. Wanted to know what double insulated actually meant. It means that if one of these wires should come off in here, you will not get electrocuted. Uh, and the reason being for this one, of course, and most hand tools, is because it's got a plastic case. So you cannot energize the case. It's an insulator. Uh, essentially, if this was metal, you would need to have that completely in all the wires in plastic in order to get that double insulator rate. Just means if a wire breaks, you can't get electrocuted. So there's no need for a ground plug. That's it. Also, love to hear your questions, comments, concerns down below me in doobly doo. I am human, did make a mistake once in the 80s. So if you have a first hand experience with some of these tools and you disagree with me, just uh, let me know why or what your findings were. You know, I'm not a professional welder by any means, but I do know how to take apart a tool.